Intra African trade levels are vastly below par, accounting for around 12% of the continent's total trade with the world. For more on the interlocking factors to explain uh, this deficit, I'm joined by Simon Fremantle, economist at Standard Bank. Simon, thanks for joining us. So, we're looking at that level that is commonly uh, used 12% of the continent's total trade uh, with the world happens within in intra African trade. Uh, but if you look at 2011's figures, it's actually below that, it's yep. around 9%. So, it's really uh, dismal. Um, but we have been making progress. What, what are your thoughts on the, kind of the levels we're sitting at right now relative to areas like Latin America and Asia? I think the important thing, first of all, that 12% is often cited. Sometimes it's even exaggerated to around 15. In my analysis, as you said, around 9% of total trade, our total trade with the world is conducted within the borders of the African continent. Structurally, that speaks to a number of deficits. Relative to other regions in Latin America, around 25% of total trade occurs within the continent. In Asia, it's closer to 50%. Levels of integration in Europe, as we know, given the EU27 and the integration of those markets, is somewhere up in the 70% category. So mm -hmm. Africa, in terms of its trade integration, and this is not uh, a new story necessarily, is vastly uh, under-integrated in terms of its trade relations. Yeah, and certainly huge potential, but certainly a lot of reasons cited for it. Um, your thoughts on the key drivers, because there are a lot of factors. We talk about infrastructure, getting the goods to the market, policy, uh, the effectiveness of regional economic communities, because we have many of those, but it seems like they're not really uh, working to the desired uh, effect. Um, so, so are those the main drivers? Well, I think there's been a lot of analysis done on that, and the purpose of our study was to say, we acknowledge and understand that infrastructure is a major bottleneck to inter-regional trade, of course. So is bureaucracy, corruption, these soft barriers that have been regularly cited by the World Bank and others as really choking trade flows. Um, and then, of course, just the political will. How effective are these regional economic groupings? How realistic are the customs union protocols? And how, uh, generally speaking, do countries abide by the regulations that mm -hmm. are in play? For me, though, I just let's yes. d d dwell on that point. I mean, how how much uh, kind of uh, oversight is there of uh, abiding by by the rules of certain uh, regional trade communities? It creates obviously you've got to provide significant teeth to the overseeing authority. And in the East African example, it's the EAC Secretariat, which sits in Arusha, which often battles to enforce the regulations which are bound by the customs union and the common market which is enacted between those five member states. Within SADC there is relatively better enforcement but at the same time it's very difficult to engage in regional partnerships with foreign trade partners for example um, when some partners will just then go and strike deals bilaterally with for example European uh, Union partner or China and so to speak and that would negate some of the benefits of a more regional mm -hmm. grouping. So there is definitely a concern that we're not ceding significant authority to to these groups that are overseeing the regional integration process and that's mm -hmm. one of the factors inhibiting. Yeah, I mean in South Africa it's interesting because South Africa really appears to be dominating when it comes to uh, to trade with the rest of the continent. So would you tie that to uh, the fact that we have a relatively better industrialized uh, country, uh, you know, bigger manufacturing base? Of course and w basically the, the point, uh, you know, all of the barriers that we know of but one that is surprisingly commented on relatively little is the structural deficit underlying weak intra-African trade. In essence, we export as a continent mostly unprocessed commodities and it finds they find markets in, in areas in the world in which there's a large scale growing industry. Asia particularly in recent years and those commodities feed that industrial growth. In Africa the absence or the lack of industry means that we have an anemic demand for the commodities that we have in abundance. So crude oil is mostly exported, base metals vast majority exported outside Africa. The second factor is that... So, so the catalyst for growing intra-African trade could essentially be industrialization. Of course. Yep. And, and I think that relates to the second factor, where Africa's rising consumer base is presenting tremendous opportunities for firms locking into that growth in Nigeria, Ethiopia and Kenya. Mm -hmm. But again, most of those products have to come from outside the continent because we're not producing them locally, with the exception of South Africa. And that's why, of total intra-African trade, South African exports account for about one quarter of that. So mm -hmm. one out of four products that are traded in Africa are, are made in South Africa and that really represents the dominance in terms of our manufacturing base. Yeah, but we have made uh, progress in Africa, uh, certainly not uh, all bad news. I mean 2001 to 2011 inter-African trade growing fivefold, sitting at around 90 billion dollars. It still pales with what we're doing with the rest of the world, um, but there are signs of progress. Where the, where, which type of commodities, uh, which sectors 
businesses, where have you seen the most progress? I think for us, the low-hanging fruit is deepening agricultural trade within the continent. Currently, Africa has some of the most pronounced agricultural potential in the world, and yet as a continent, we're a net importer of food, which is an untenable situation. What generally tends to happen is a lot of agricultural markets throughout the, uh, the continent tend to focus on agriculture as a source of foreign exchange, as a means for export revenue. We need to see more of a focus on domestic and regional food security, and we need to deepen the trade of staple crops throughout the continent. That uh, alone could probably lead to an increase of 50% or upwards of intra-African trade in a relatively short space of time. Because that's where we're producing the goods or we have the capacity to do so, and there is very uh, rising and latent demand on the continent. Obviously, long term, we have to develop manufacturing expertise, starting at the low end. For example, shoemaking in Ethiopia is starting to develop. Mm -hmm. The primary market for those products will be within East Africa and with, within the African market. But I think for now, the low-hanging fruit is certainly in agriculture, and certainly then also using South African manufacturing and some other bases, for example, Nairobi uh, as, a, as a services ICT hub, uh, potentially start to produce some goods which could be exported into the region. And certainly, I mean, when you see like a tiger brand, going into Nigeria with the JV looking to bring their manufacturing expertise to market where of course there's big demand and there's also the raw materials uh, you see that as a way forward when it comes to boosting a draft and trade in the agricultural sector absolutely and I think what we need certainly from South Africa's perspective South African companies could leverage the advantages of establishing manufacturing or low, low um, level manufacturing operations in the rest of Africa obviously labor uh, costs remain relatively competitive globally. Infrastructure and power is a concern, mm -hmm. but in some uh, areas, for example, South African breweries in East Africa and elsewhere, they've managed to skirt those through some, some very pragmatic engagement with local government, sometimes investing in infrastructure themselves, adopting a model that mining companies have done throughout Africa for several decades.